their behalf. Senator Cadell. Mr Deputy President, as the uh, minister responsible for this has admitted, these bills are not required. Even today, the Greens have conceded that these bills are largely symbolic. So let's not gild the lily. This bill does nothing to fix the climate emergency. Let's not have a lend of ourselves. This bill does not lower one milligram of emissions. Let's not paint stripes on a horse and tell me it's a zebra. This bill does not save the planet. One thing this bill is not is a plan. But this form of symbolism has consequences, and the burden of these consequences will be borne by regional Australia. I'll sideline a little bit. I was hurt by the, the words that if you oppose this bill, you are some sort of psychopath or a shill for the mining industry. I think we're better than that. I think that lowers the tone of people's experiences in life, and I don't think it, it ends in a solution that we want to do in this party. Unlike most members opposite, I have lived with coal for most of my life. Growing up, I could see the drag lines from my parents' kitchen window every morning. My community in the Hunter, which Labor Party claims to represent, runs on coal. From the mine to the mechanic to the general store, without support, as we have seen in Europe, it is these communities that will lose their jobs, lose security and ultimately lose hope. How do I face people I went to school with who work in the industry and tell them I didn't do enough to protect their job, their home and their family? None of them want to hurt the planet. They don't want to jump in the ranger and go off to work with dreams of melting glaciers. They just want to put a meal on the table and a roof over their head. How do I tell Scott that if he manages to get a job paying $70,000 less, you know, I didn't stand up for him? We must not fall into the same trap as Europe. We must learn from their mistakes of the past, and we must ensure that we support those who will be impacted the hardest. The Nationals believe in practical action to address the impacts of climate change and a no person and no place left behind approach to their transition. It appears that all parties of government believe we need to reach net zero, and I think we do believe it can be achieved but also believe targets based solely on ideology without any real plan will not achieve a fair outcome for communities. I am one of the few in this place that went to uh, COP last year. I toured regions in the north of England and parts of Scotland that have been crippled by a sudden and severe reduction and elimination of mining, steel and manufacturing. The advice was most common when I was asking the question of a way to look for transition was, we can show you how not to do it. The Nationals believe that if we to decarbonise the economy, it has to be fair and just. I sat on the inquiry for this bill. I also listened to the evidence presented to us of the intended and unintended consequences that these bills will yield. The committee was presented with evidence that a typical worker in a regional Australia is over three times more likely to have their jobs put at risk by the policy of net zero emissions by 2050 than a typical worker in the inner city. This is because workers in regional areas are far more likely to work in industries such as coal mining, heavy industry and agriculture. We received submissions, as my leader before me said, that show that to achieve the government's target, all 89 coal, gas and oil projects in the construction pipeline must be cancelled. This will come at the cost of approximately 480,000 jobs, which would have otherwise been created. The UN has stated a global, a global transition towards a low carbon and sustainable economy has both positive and negative impacts on employment. Policymakers must smooth the edges of this transformation by developing just transition policies for effective workers in their communities. In 2021, the European Union announced the European Green Deal with more than 500 billion euro package providing tangible investments to deliver sustainable social outcomes as member states transition through their economies. Neither these bills or the government to date have acknowledged the same principles outlined by the EU or the UN. The committee was not furnished with any evidence, either by submission or testimony, that the government has any intention of a similar package being developed or being considered. 
Just like the science where those opposite quote the infallibility of the IEA when they say that wind will grow 25 per cent higher on average over the next five years and 24 per cent for solar, but they can't accept the same body and the same science saying without an important contribution from nuclear power, the global, global energy transition will be much that, harder, that much harder. Those opposite also want all the corporate climate change strategies of Europe but want to supply none of the safety measures for region, regional communities that were put in place. Regional Australia, under the Greens' Labor policy, is to get all of the pain and none of the gain. The Australian government cannot guarantee, through faith alone, that the promise of carbon neutral jobs from new industries, energy pro projects and technology will be in the same communities as those predicted job losses. The Nationals consider that legislating a 43 per cent reduction in CO2 emissions by 2030 without a complementary package of financial support for affected communities and carbon intensive industries, particularly in rural and regional Australia, presents a clear and present danger to the welfare of our communities. The Nationals believe a guaranteed investment package based on the United Nations principles develop leveraging opportunities generated from the global focus on technological advancements to decarbonise economies is required. If managed properly and administered sensibly, such investments have the potential to grow the Australian economy and create new work opportunities in the regions whilst transitioning those impacted workers, uh, workforces and local economies. The Nationals believe there is widespread community and industry support to establish regional transition authority, or several, to address specific regional communities and outcomes. We need to get the boots on the ground. The inquiry heard it has specific support from the likes of the Business Council of Australia, the Grattan Institute and the Blueprint Institute to do this. Over the last two decades, we have been told we must listen to experts and transitions to net zero. Listening to the experts over the two days of hearings, we heard, and I quote, to achieve net zero transition, we are going to need to build a lot of big things and many distributed small things around the country, major new mines for lithium, for rare earths and for a range of other inputs, by Mr Tennant Reid. Can we afford to delay the mining approvals for these things if we are to transition, but no plan is in place? Again, I quote, by 2030 globally, we need to increase lithium production fourfold, double rare earth element output and deliver a 67 per cent increase in nickel and produce 32 per cent more copper. That was from Ms Constable. Our new net zero economy relies upon increased rooftop, farm solar projects and electric vehicles coming these elements. All of these elements require rare earth minerals sooner rather than later. However, the problem is, and I quote again, in terms of what is being suggested, we will need more copper investment to occur more nickel and cobalt to occur, and that is not happening. I don't think we're on the right trajectory with things like copper. We're just not exploring enough and not finding enough of the new mines of the future, said Mr Zavatiero. If we aren't doing enough to build the things to get there, we are in trouble. Without these resources, building the connectivity required for 82 per cent target of renewables under Labor is not going to happen. So if we are to transition to net zero, we need to increase mining of rare minerals. This will also assist in growing our economy and offsetting potential job losses. Where is the plan for this? Where is the support for this? There is none. So tomorrow morning, this bill will proceed. A goal without a plan, giving the regions fear but not hope. We will be told we have to honour the percentage of science that affirms the views of those opposite whilst ignoring the science that they don't agree with. And essentially, that is what this bill is. What I stated at the beginning, from the mouths of some opposite, a bill that is largely symbolic, or as the minister responsible said, a bill that is not required. Why are we doing this? Minister, please sum up the debate. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy Speaker. Uh, my apologies, President. Um, the passage of this bill would be a landmark day for climate action in Australia. And the government is proud of this legislation. It's a demonstration of our commitment to ambitious action on climate change, to transparency and to accountability on this defining issue of our time. We are entering a new phase, 
We move on from discussing whether we will join the global transition and instead discuss how. And we are working with workers, businesses, farmers and climate advocates. We can and we must take strong climate action and start taking the real and necessary steps to creating a low carbon future. And that is what this bill does. These bills provide the clearest signal this parliament can provide that Australia is serious about climate action, serious about building a net zero economy and serious about capturing the jobs, the investment and the other benefits that a net zero economy will bring. These bills demonstrate that we are serious when we say that we care about future generations and the effects of climate change on the world that they will inherit. The Climate Change Bill legislates Australia's emission reductions targets to be achieved by 2030 and by 2050. It makes clear that these targets are a floor, not a ceiling on our ambition. The bill enhances accountability and transparency through an annual statement to parliament reporting on Australia's progress towards the targets informed by independent expert advice from the Climate Change Authority. It provides for independent advice from the authority on future targets. The consequential amendments embed consideration of the targets into the objects and functions of a range of Commonwealth entities and schemes, focusing effort and ensuring that they are all pulling in the same direction. These bills have been developed and added to following collaborative, good faith discussions with other members of parliament. In July, the government invited the Australian parliament to end the climate wars that have stymied and delayed action for so many years, and many across the parliament accepted that invitation. The government consulted with interested members of parliament in good faith. We have agreed to reasonable amendments that strengthen the bills, are consistent with the government's election mandate, and will facilitate the passage of these important reforms. The government thanks those members and senators for their engagement. The government also thanks the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee for its comprehensive report on the bills. Naturally, we agree with the committee's recommendation that the Climate Change Bill and the Consequential Amendments Bill be passed. The committee also recommended that after the bills are passed, the government undertake further consultation on possible legislative amendments and policy responses, including reviewing the use of native forest wood waste for renewable energy and the transition arrangements for Australian workers affected by decarbonisation. On Tuesday, Minister Bowen announced the government will release a consultation paper on the native forest wood waste issue, inviting stakeholder views on the changes recommended by Senator Pocock and the Greens party. The concerns raised relate to a decision by the Abbott government in 2015 to put native forest wood waste back into the scheme. The government will consider next steps in light of the results of that consultation and look to make any necessary changes to the regulations by the end of the year. We understand that the issues raised relates to eligibility under the renewable energy target. It is not a reflection on the government's general support for sustainable native forest industries and the workers that depend on those industries. Minister Bowen had previously committed to exploring further amendments to primary and subordinate legislation to embed the targets and the Paris Agreement into a wider set of relevant legislation and schemes. We will undertake that review and consult with stakeholders, implement further actions and report back to the parliament in the second annual statement. We will welcome suggestions for further amendments. Looking beyond the bills to the broader implications of the net zero transition for Australian workers, I note that the Greens in their dissenting report recommended that a statutory authority be established. Climate action brings enormous job opportunities, but it also brings challenges. At last week's Jobs and Skills Summit, the government committed to a coordinated approach with industry, unions, local governments and communities to assist affected workers and regional communities prosper in a clean energy future. We will continue to work with states, territories, unions, industries and communities to deliver a framework for net zero economic development in our regions, including through the National Energy Transformation Partnership agreed by energy ministers last month. As the Prime Minister has said on numerous occasions, this is a government that will make sure that no one is held back and no one is left behind. And that includes the workers who build, maintain 
and operate our energy system and us, who are so crucial for its transformation. Decarbonisation of the global energy system and the broader economy presents immense opportunities for Australia's regions and reduces the serious threats to rural and regional areas that arise from unchecked climate change. This government is committed to harnessing these opportunities and to a brighter, more hopeful and more prosperous future. The Greens also recommended in their dissenting report that a climate trigger should be placed on all projects in development so that the Environment Minister can assess projects against the government's emissions targets. The government will formally respond to the Samuel Review of the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act to help strengthen Australia's environmental protection law. The government has committed to introduce legislation in 2023 following extensive consultation and uh, consideration and consultation. We are currently consulting on changes to the safeguard mechanism to cover existing and new facilities with over 100,000 tonnes of direct emissions. I also thank Senator Andrew Bragg for his engagement with the Senate inquiry into the bills. I am pleased to say that the government agrees with him that the market should be supported to invest in low and zero emissions energy and the transmission infrastructure required to decarbonise. Our Powering Australia and Rewiring the Nation policies are providing that support. We note Senator Bragg's recommendation that the Australian government should support the supply of gas as a transition fuel. We understand gas is not a low emissions fuel, but it does play an important part in helping power communities by firming, and peaking, firming peaking electricity uh, and as a feedstock and source of heat for industry. We also concur with Senator Barrett Bragg's view that Australia should be a first mover in legislating an emissions disclosure regime. We are committed to ensuring large businesses, including financial institutions, provide Australians and investors with greater transparency and accountability when it comes to climate-related plans, risks and opportunities. The Treasurer is leading work to introduce a standardised, internationally aligned reporting requirement to ensure that climate-related disclosures are usable, credible and comparable, which will be informed by substantial consultation. The government does not, however, agree with Senator Bragg's recommendation to lift the nuclear energy prohibition. This is a distraction from the need to implement cuts to pollution now to meet our targets and to put downward pressure on power bills through the deployment of renewable energy. I thank Senator David Pocock for his contribution to the Senate Committee inquiry and his genuine engagement with the government to discuss the bills. As a result of those discussions, the government will be agreeing to a number of amendments relating to the transparency and content of the annual statement to Parliament and the Climate Change Authority's advice. The government does not accept the other recommendations in the report. I note that some opposition senators have raised concerns about this bill enabling <coughs> climate litigation. The legislation does not change the statutory decision-making for other legislative schemes such as the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. The idea that it gives rise to new causes of action or litigation against resources projects is just another excuse. As BP submitted to the Senate inquiry, our hope is that by legislating the target and providing a transparent and accountable <laughs> framework for its delivery, the legislation might even reduce the uncertainty that can sometimes be a driver for litigation. Santos, when questioned on the risk of litigation, said no. The Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water's submissions stated this. The bills do not create new legal risks for the Commonwealth. They explained that the bills are different from the UK bills, so the same risks do not apply. This is typical of the ob objections so frequently raised by the opposition. They are so often prosecuting concerns that seem to be shared by them alone and are out of step with agricultural leaders, with business leaders, with not-for-profit organisations and indeed with common sense. And the truth is that those opposite have been too busy arguing with themselves to do anything over the past decade. They squabbled their way through 22 energy policies and in their last year of government oversaw one of the biggest spikes in emissions in 15 years. Our government is acting to end the years of delay, dysfunction, denial and denigration. These bills will lay the foundation of the biggest economic transformation in our lifetime. This is our duty 
to our children, our grandchildren and to future Australians. This is necessary to safeguard Australia's environment, our community and our economy. And this is necessary to unlock the innovation and investment that we need to drive gro jobs and growth in the industries that will underpin our prosperity in the decades to come. I intend to put the question. I put the question that the bill be read a, now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Is there a division required? A division will we take place pursuant to order tomorrow. Pursuant to order, the Senate now stands adjourned and we will gather again tomorrow at 0900 hours, 9.30 hours.